Greetings and welcome to 303 and Junior English. We turn in your hymnals now to page 728, 729 and following. And we turn now to the great American writer F. Scott Fitzgerald. Okay? We're going to start over on page 729 actually. And we want to make some comments about this guy and who he was and why he matters in American thought. Let's say a couple of things before we get to the biography itself. One, the first thing we want to say about Fitzgerald is that he is known in American letters as arguably our greatest novelist. Okay? Now, of course, this can be debated. What about Faulkner? What about Hemingway? What about any number of other American authors? But many people will argue that Fitzgerald was able to capture a time period. And in some ways, he becomes the voice of that time period of that generation. What time period? Well, it's, for your notes, usually referred to as the Roaring Twenties. The first war, the Great War, will end, right, four years after 1914, right, 1918. Then we have a very interesting period following the Great War where there's a lot of wealth that immediately starts to exchange hands. And because of this wealth, you have a whole group of people who are known to be of that upper class. Okay? And they enjoy life with money. Right? That is to say the roaring crazy 20s. That is to say the 1920s. I have to say that because one of my students once said out loud, oh, I thought it meant the roaring 20s, meaning when they're 20 years old and they get to do crazy all the time. No, 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 that is true often for college students, right, that in their 20s they do crazy. But what the roaring 20s mean is the, the decade of the 1920s, when many people, not everybody, many people, many Americans especially, enjoyed economic growth unparalleled. Okay? Well, what's the problem with that? Well, while there's a lot of good with that, the problem with that, of course, is that you can have a whole group of people who all they ever do is spend their money and party. Okay? And they, they kind of can become then disassociated from the real world, if you get my drift. Okay? Fitzgerald, as a writer, was very interested in these kinds of people. And so he'll write stories about these kinds of people. Of course, the most famous novel is the classic Great <coughs> Gatsby. Okay? Now, of course, Gatsby made into a number of different films. Maybe you're familiar. We have, in our junior English class, we, we assign this novel and we read it. The Great Gatsby is going to play the game of Winter Dreams, the story that we're going to study here. Fitzgerald is often interested in something we will call the American dream. I would write that down. The American dream. Not always, but often, when Fitzgerald writes one of his texts, he is critiquing the American dream. And in fact, this is a story, Winter Dreams, where the word dream is actually in the title. Okay? So we're going to have to ask this question, what do we mean by the American dream? Some have called it a myth, that it doesn't actually exist at all, which is why it's called a dream. And the idea behind this is the notion that in America, very special place. Why? Because you can begin with absolutely nothing, and you can make it. Right? You can make it. You can find a way to make money. You can find a way to gain power. And in the history of America, we have lots of examples of this. Of course, some of our most remarkable examples of this are people who went on out of absolute nothing, abject poverty, to become the most powerful people in the country. Think about, for example, our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, who literally grows up with absolutely nothing to become President of the United States. What country can boast that kind of history? The answer, by the way, is not very many countries. Why? Because most countries have an understanding that the people who run the country come from a very elite, wealthy class. And then, those are the ones who get all the money and the power. America's got a history 
of a number of people who start out with absolutely nothing to make it. That making it is what we mean by the American dream. Now, one of the questions that Fitzgerald will ask is, is it real? Is it legit? And what would happen if you did go from absolutely nothing to money? Now, lots of it. How would it change your life? Would it change who you are fundamentally? Let's read a bit about Fitzgerald. You can see the dates there. 1896, he dies in 1940. When you open the pages of one of F. Scott Fitzgerald's books, I'm reading with you now on 729, just read along with me. You're transported back in time to the roaring 20s, when many Americans lived with reckless abandon, attending wild parties, wearing glamorous clothing, and striving for fulfillment through material wealth. Yet this quest for pleasure was often accompanied by a sense of inner despair. I would write that word despair down. It's a very popular word when you read Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald was able to capture the paradoxes of this glittering materialistic lifestyle because he actually lived it. A quick rise to fame, the next heading. Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, into a family with high social aspirations but little wealth. As a young man, Fitzgerald was eager to improve his social standing. He attended Princeton University in 1913, where he pursued the type of high-profile social life for which he would later become famous. Fitzgerald failed to graduate and soon enlisted in the Army. His first novel, This Side of Paradise, in 1920, published shortly after his discharge from the service, was an instant success. Buoyed by the fame and wealth the book gave him, Fitzgerald courted Zelda Sire, a southern belle with whom he had fallen in love while in the army. They married in 1920. Together, they blazed an extravagant trail across New York and Europe, mingling with the rich and famous and spending money recklessly. An American masterpiece, the next heading. Despite his pleasure-seeking lifestyle, Fitzgerald remained a productive writer. In 1925, he published The Great Gatsby, the story of a self-made man whose dreams of love and social acceptance end in tragedy. The book is widely considered to be Fitzgerald's masterpiece and one of the greatest novels in American literature. The final heading, Fortune's Turn. After the 1929 stock market crash, Fitzgerald's world began to crumble. His wife suffered a series of nervous breakdowns and financial problems forced him to seek work as a screenwriter. Despite these setbacks, however, he managed to produce many more short stories and a second novel, Tender is the Night, 1934. He was in the midst of writing The Last Tycoon when he died of a heart attack in 1940. His editor approached the novelist John O'Hara about finishing the book, but O'Hara declined. In a letter, O'Hara wrote to the author, John Steinbeck. He explained his refusal. Quote, Fitzgerald was a better, was a better, just plain writer than all of us put together. Just words write. End quote. High praise. Let's turn now to the story we will be studying. Winter Dreams. We're on page 728, are preparing to read, and we're going to begin at level 2B. This again won't shock you that we spend so much time at that rhetorical level at 2B. We're going to look at the literary analysis. Look at it with me on 728. Read with me. All fictional works have characters, the personalities represented in a story. Characters fall into two basic categories. I would be writing this down. We have flat characters, one-dimensional, few character traits. Their main role is to advance the action. Round characters have many character traits. They're usually the main characters. Authors use these specific strategies to develop characters. We have two different kinds of characterization. I hope you write this down as well at 2B. Direct characterization. The narrator simply tells the reader what a character is like. For example, she is honest. That's direct characterization. Indirect characterization, here the writer reveals characters through their thoughts, actions, words, and other characters' reactions. As you read, notice how Fitzgerald brings his characters into sharp focus. Under reading strategy, notice that we're going to be challenged to draw emphasis, inferences about characters. And in fact, you even have a little chart here that can kind of help you. 
you're going to have two major characters of this story. So you want to identify them early on. Who are these major characters? Okay. Finally, on page 728, there are several vocabulary words. You see those six words listed at the bottom of 728. You definitely want to know those words because I guarantee you they're going to end up on the examination. Okay. Now our challenge is to turn and read this story. One of the first things I want to point out about this story is its length. Go ahead and start um, scanning through the pages to just identify that this is a story of close to 20 pages long. Now why do I point this out? Because as you get ready to read this story, it will make sense for you to point out to yourself that the story is divided into chapters or parts. Look quickly with me on page 735. Do you see at the top of page 735 the number 2? Go ahead and flip through a little bit more and go to page 740. Do you see at the top of page 740 the number 3? What I recommend that you do is to keep going through and identifying how many of these numbers we have. At the top of page 742, you've got chapter 4. By the way, there's the picture of his girl on 742 in that little box there. Okay. Notice that we have chapter 5 on 749, very brief chapter or part, and then chapter 6 on 749. Do you see it? And so that's it. You have six different parts. So what I recommend you do right now at level 1 is to simply write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 and skip three lines between each one of the numbers. That will allow you at level one to simply report what happens when the chapter is in. Okay? By the time we're finished, we're going to be ready to ask two questions that I recommend you write down. Okay? Question number one. Who are the two most important characters in the story? I'll give you a hint. This is a guy and a girl story. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing that you're going to want to pay attention to is the issue of conflict. Write that down. Conflict. What is the central conflict of this story? And as we get ready to ask that question, we're going to have to ask about the American dream. We'll begin with some background information on 731. I hope you're there with me. Written in 1922, an important year, by the way, for any number of reasons. We've already mentioned that James Joyce's Ulysses is published in 1922, the greatest novel of the 20th century, and T.S. Eliot's Wasteland is published in 1922, the great, many, many argue, the greatest poem of the 20th century. Written in 1922, this story unfolds against the background of the Jazz Age, focusing on Dexter Green's obsession with Judy Jones. Uh-oh, so there you go. So you've got a guy named Dexter Green. you got a girl named Judy Jones. Who is Judy Jones? A beautiful young woman from a prominent wealthy family. Fitzgerald explores the connections between love, money, and social status. Through Dexter, Fitzgerald shows what life was like in the 1920s for an ambitious young man driven by the desire for glittering things. All right, now we're just going to read the story. I have a professional reader reading the story for us. Here's what I challenge you to do. Stay focused by trying to follow every word of the story. Again, you can follow with the tip of your pen or pencil, and that way you can try and see, can I keep up, as opposed to just letting the person read the story for me. You could do that when you were six years old sitting in an elementary room and they read you stories. The challenge here is to try to conquer monkey mind, as we said in earlier lectures, to focus and see if you can read all the way through this story. By the way, as we've sometimes said about ACT prep, and we're juniors, and so obviously that matters to us, if you're talking about ACT prep, it is a three-hour reading test, which begs the question, can you read nonstop for three hours? Because if you can't, you're going to struggle in the ACT regardless of what you know. Let's challenge ourselves to see how well we can read this story. Winter dreams. We're going to pay attention to those two observations about character and about conflict. All right? Here we go. Let's pay attention. Winter dreams. Winter dreams. 
by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Some of the caddies were poor as sin and lived in one-room houses with a neurasthenic cow in the front yard. But Dexter Green's father owned the second best grocery store in Black Bear. The best one was The Hub, patronized by the wealthy people from Sherry Island, and Dexter caddied only for pocket money. In the fall, when the days became crisp and gray and the long Minnesota winter shut down like the white lid of a box, Dexter's skis moved over the snow that hid the fairways of the golf course. At these times, the country gave him a feeling of profound melancholy. It offended him that the lynx should lie in enforced fallowness, haunted by ragged sparrows for the long season. It was dreary, too, that on the tees, where the gay colors fluttered in summer, there were now only the desolate sandboxes, knee-deep covered in crusted ice. When he crossed the hills, the wind blew cold as misery, and if the sun was out, he tramped with his eyes squinted up against the hard, dimensionless glare. In April, the winter ceased abruptly. The snow ran down into Black Bear Lake, scarcely tarrying for the early golfers to brave the season with red and black balls. Without elation, without an interval of moist glory, the cold was gone. Dexter knew that there was something dismal about this northern spring, just as he knew there was something gorgeous about the fall. Fall made him clinch his hands and tremble and repeat idiotic sentences to himself and make brisk, abrupt gestures of command to imaginary audiences and armies. October filled him with hope, which November raised to a sort of ecstatic triumph and in this mood, the fleeting, brilliant impressions of the summer at Sherry Island were ready grist to his mill. He became a golf champion and defeated Mr. T.A. Hedrick in a marvelous match played a hundred times over the fairways of his imagination, a match each detail of which he changed about untiringly. Sometimes he won with almost laughable ease, Sometimes he came up magnificently from behind. Again, stepping from a Pierce Arrow automobile, like Mr. Mortimer Jones, he strolled frigidly into the lounge of the Sherry Island Golf Club. Or perhaps, surrounded by an admiring crowd, he gave an exhibition of fancy diving from the springboard of the club raft. Among those who watched him in open-mouthed wonder was Mr. Mortimer Jones. And one day, it came to pass that Mr. Jones, himself, and not his ghost, came up to Dexter with tears in his eyes and said that Dexter was the best caddy in the club. And wouldn't he decide not to quit if Mr. Jones made it worth his while because every other caddy in the club lost one ball a hole for him regularly. No, sir, said Dexter decisively. I don't want to caddy anymore. Then after a pause, I'm too old. You're not more than 14. Why the devil did you decide just this morning that you wanted to quit? You promised that next week you'd go over to the state tournament with me. I decided I was too old. Dexter handed in his A-class badge, collected what money was due him from the caddy master, and walked home to Black Bear Village. The best Caddy I ever saw, shouted Mr. Mortimer Jones over a drink that afternoon. Never lost a ball. Willing, intelligent, quiet, honest, grateful. The little girl who had done this was 11. Beautifully ugly, as little girls are apt to be, who are destined after a few years to be inexpressibly lovely and bring no end of misery to a great number of men. The spark, however, was perceptible. There was a general ungodliness in the way her lips twisted down at the corners when she smiled, and in the, heaven help us, in the almost passionate quality of her eyes. Vitality is born early in such women. It was utterly in evidence now, shining through her thin frame in a sort of glow. 
She had come eagerly out onto the course at nine o'clock with a white linen nurse and five small new golf clubs in a white canvas bag which the nurse was carrying. When Dexter first saw her, she was standing by the caddy house, rather ill at ease and trying to conceal the fact by engaging her nurse in an obviously unnatural conversation graced by startling and irrelevant grimaces from herself. Well, it's certainly a nice day, Hilda, Dexter heard her say. She drew down the corners of her mouth, smiled, and glanced furtively around, her eyes in transit falling for an instant on Dexter. Then to the nurse, well, I guess there aren't very many people out here this morning, are there? The smile again, radiant, blatantly artificial, convincing. I don't know what we're supposed to do now, said the nurse, looking nowhere in particular. Oh, that's all right. I'll fix it up. Dexter stood perfectly still, his mouth slightly ajar. He knew that if he moved forward a step, his stare would be in her line of vision. If he moved backward, he would lose his full view of her face. For a moment, he had not realized how young she was. Now he remembered having seen her several times the year before, in bloomers. Suddenly, involuntarily, he laughed. A short, abrupt laugh. Then, startled by himself, he turned and began to walk quickly away. Boy! Dexter stopped. Boy! Beyond question, he was addressed. Not only that, but he was treated to that absurd smile, that preposterous smile, the memory of which at least a dozen men were to carry into middle age. Boy, do you know where the golf teacher is? He's giving a lesson, 